could all stand and uh, turn our Bibles, amen, to Psalms chapter 40, verses 1 through 4. And then we're going to bookmark 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 21. And then Psalm, and Psalms chapter 40, verses 1 through 4. When you find it, why don't you say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen, 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 amen. Yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Psalms chapter 40, verses 1 through 4. We'll read alternate verses. I'll read one, you read one. Is that all right? Yeah. Amen. 40, verse 1. It says this. I waited patiently. That's a problem. Anyway, moving on. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. And he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it. And fear and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and speaketh not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Amen. Let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter five, and we'll read verses seventeen through twenty-one in the same manner. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To it, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not in putting their trespasses upon them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. For he, has made, for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. The focus verse for today's lesson is what we just read. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, and let's, let's read that together one more time. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, Behold, all things are become new. Amen. You may be seated here today in Jesus' name. As we go through the lesson, the focus thought for the lesson is that Jesus came with the purpose of seeking and saving lost humanity. That's the focus thought for today's lesson. All right? So I want us to encourage ourselves and remind ourselves that Jesus came to seek and to save lost humanity, not to give me everything I want, right? Jesus came to seek and to save lost humanity, not to bow to my every need and desire, right? Okay? So it's okay if God tells you no, right? Because that's not why he came, right? It's okay if you don't get that new car or new house or new job, because that's not why he came, right? It's okay if things don't go your way because that's not why he came, right? Okay. All right. So the culture connection for today is a brand new heart. It's titled A Brand New Heart. It says in, this heart, in his article, Scott Hetzko talks about his new heart. Brian Sharp conversed with a Rochester, New York area meteorologist about his experience of receiving a heart transplant. Hetzko spoke of his critical health battle in which he desperately needed a transplant. He spoke with gratitude of the noticeable difference he detected in his new heartbeat. Sharp writes, the prognosis for heart transplant recipient is good. The survival rate in the United States is 88% after one year and 75% after five years. The advancement of medical technology over the past half century 
has been amazing, especially in the area of performing heart transplants. But God has been successfully conducting heart transplants for hundreds of years. Through his Old Testament prophets, God promised the people of Israel a day when he would take away their stony heart out of your flesh, and he would give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. From the time of the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost, God has been giving new hearts to those who will receive his Holy Spirit. Further, the survival rate for this heart transplant is 100%. For those who embrace the desire to change and who continue to follow God's spiritual regimen, the survey, the response, the result is 100% survival rate. Amen? But the lesson says those who embrace the desire to change. Now, I want you to say something for me real quick. I want you to say this, all right, because it's in here, but I want us to bring it out. Reality. Say, say this. I'm not going to change if I don't want to. I ain't going to argue with you. You're right. I'm not going to change if I don't want to. Amen? And so, God, we have to choose to change. When God fills you with his Holy Spirit, you have to choose to live for him. You have to choose to die out to your own desires. You have to choose to change. Amen? Deuteronomy, choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. Today I set before you blessings and cursing, life and death. Choose life. So you have the choice to make here today in Jesus' name. The Contemplating the topic, it says this. From the beginning, God created human beings with an inborn longing for relationship with him. Often, individuals have, have felt something was lacking in their lives, but they could not understand what it was. They only knew they longed for something or someone that reached beyond this mundane plane of mere existence. In whatever terms they could comprehend, they began to seek to fulfill the spiritual aspect of their nature, looking for the creator, the sovereign giver of life, God the Almighty. Simply stated, they were trying to fill the void in their lives that can be filled and satisfied only by the Almighty. Not far in history, the serpent deceived Eve into partaking of the forbidden fruit. He then offered the fruit to her husband, Adam, who also succumbed to temptation. They fell off the precipice of innocence into a lifelong spiral towards death and judgment, forever changing the face of the human experience on earth. From their first taste of guilt and condemnation and their meager efforts to cover their nakedness with fig leaves, Adam and Eve and every descendant thereafter have unsuccessfully grappled with sin and loss. Consequently, all individuals have sought relief from condemnation. All have sought for ways to escape the pangs of guilt and torment caused by their sinful nature and lifestyles. All have longed for, all have longed, hoped, and looked for a better day, a day of redemption and salvation from their sin. Many of us turn to drugs, and many of us turn to alcohol. Amen? But we are looking for something to fill a void within us that only God will fill. That is the reason why every time you go to drugs and alcohol, you get that high, but then you come off that high. You get that fixed, but it's temporary. Amen? Because deep down inside, the only thing that will truly satisfy you is when you make that connection with God Almighty. When you choose to make that connection with God Almighty. Amen? If you want to be in a fruitless errand, if you want to waste your life, amen? If you want to waste the life that God has given you, then you have got to reject the fact that there is a God and seek to find satisfaction somewhere else. And you are guaranteed to waste every waking moment that God has given you. But when you realize that there is a God, hallelujah, when you realize that there is a God and his purpose is to be in relationship with you and your purpose is to be in a relationship with him and you start to pursue that, then you're going to find satisfaction. Then you're going to find what you need. Amen? 
then you will have purpose in your life. Amen. It says throughout the Old Testament, God's and God's throughout the Old Testament and God's progressive dealings with his creation, he has given glimpses of hopes, indications of a better day to come and hope of release from the bondage of sin. His first promise of a better future came immediately following mankind's plunge into sinful disobedience. God judged the serpent and promised ultimately to crush his head. He said in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Adam and Eve could not have begun to comprehend the prophetic nuances of God's words to the serpent. But God had already begun to lay out a pathway to lead human beings out of sin and into a vibrant and living relationship with him. The long-term plan involved the incarnation, which would lead to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. With his ultimate plan in view, God gradually revealed and fulfilled his plan. Over the course of hundreds of years, God spoke to his people through prophecies and periodically gave them prophetic glimpses of and hopes of the Messiah. Hope for a future, a future and hope for rep repentance. Amen. Redemption. The lesson talks about getting a new heart. Amen. And the question goes out is this. Why do you think we sometimes stray from the Lord's path for us? And what can you do to stay on track with God? See, many of us have strayed. Many of us are going to stray, amen, right, from the path that God has laid out for us. Many of us spend many nights beating ourselves over the head saying, why, 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 why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep falling? Why do I keep straying? Amen? And so the lesson says here, throughout his, Israel's history, the people often wandered from the righteous precepts of God that God had given them and ventured into sin and idolatry. After a season of rebellious departure, the national losses and setback, a prophet would arise and preach fervently to the people, prompting national revival and restoration of righteousness. We as humanity, we go through a cycle. Amen? We go through a cycle that God desires to break. We come to God, we find hope, and we find redemption, but then we get comfortable because we want to be able to just plug in and forget all about it. Amen? But nothing works that way. No relationship works that way. If you're married in this house here today, if, if, if you've got a girlfriend, if you've ever had a girlfriend, which relationship works when you go, all right, you're my wife, you're my husband, cool, and that's it. No more interaction. No more trying, no more communication, and that works, right? How many, how many go to work and say, hey, boss, thank you for the job. I'll be in the back office if you need me, and that's it. No commitment, no dedication, no production. Who going to get fired, right? See, we desire innately to, to, to plug in and just relax, but nothing works that way, and God does not work that way. The relationship that you have with God, the life that you have with God, requ requires you to constantly move towards God and away from the world. So Israel, they get to God, then they get comfortable and start to think that they could do things on their own, and they fall away from God. And so when you think you're big and you think you're bad and you think you can stand, then you think you're too big for God, God's going to say, all right, well, you go ahead and handle it. He's not going to fight you down. But then after that, rebellion kicks in. And so if you're in a rebellious state, pastor can't even preach to you. God cannot reach you. No one can get to a rebellious heart. But that rebellious heart, the cycle continues, will lead to a point where you will lose everything. And if you still have the life that is remaining in you, at the bottom of the barrel, you will realize I have lost everything and it's not God's fault, it's my fault. So you come to a realization. And when you get to that point, 
The verse that we read in the beginning, he lift us up out of a horrible pit, right? God says, okay, now you are ready. And the word of God comes and you are able to get redemption. But you have to first ask God for forgiveness. If you never repent, then you never acknowledge the fact that you have turned your back on God or you have sinned, right? So if you don't think you can sin or if you don't think you have sinned, God's not going to forgive you of something you don't believe you need forgiveness of. But when you ask God for repentance, then God says, you know what? Ask and you shall receive. That ain't about money. That's temporal. Ask and you shall receive, God. Give me this house. No, that's not about all that because all that garbage goes away. Your house, your car, your job, it all goes away. Ask for forgiveness and God is faithful and just to forgive. Amen? So we have got to recognize the pattern that we have to or we potentially can go through as humanity. And the only way to break that cycle is to constantly place this flesh under subjection. Amen? And I'm jumping ahead here real quick and I'm trying to stay within the lesson. Um, but, you know, so we have to ask God to create in us a clean heart. We need a new heart. Jesus, I need a heart transplant because the heart that got me to your feet is the heart that got me in trouble. How many times in Christianity we want to come crawling to God, right? Because we done messed it all up and God cleans us up. He changes our lives. He redeems us. And then we think that it's okay for me to go back to the life that I was living before I came to God. That's what got you in a bad place in the first place. So if you go back to that, you're going to go back to what you used to be. But if you allow God to redirect your path, mm-hmm right? Then you have a different outcome. They always say stupidity or craziness, right, is doing the same exact thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome, right? That's one of the, the easy definition of being crazy. You do the same exact thing over and over again, but you expect something different to happen in the end. How many times in our walk with God, we do the same exact thing over and over again, and we expect a different outcome? Moving on. If, there, if ever there was to be a fundamental change within the people of God, there would have to be a genuine change of heart. Such was the promise God gave through his prophets as they predicted future days. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 through 19, it says that we, God will do a new work. A new work. Amen? No longer do we have to bring sacrifices, bulls and cows and goats and all that crazy stuff. No longer do we have to bring all that to a temple and have a priest shed that blood for us. You see? Many of us want... Not many of us. There are people out there that want to go back to that. But you have got to realize people of God. Jesus spoke the bulls into existence. He spoke the animals into existence. But when it came to giving you and I life, the Bible says that he breathed the breath of life into us. So that lets you know or should let you know that that bull or that goat that was spoken into existence is not comparable to the life that was breathed into you and I. That's why them sacrifices wasn't good enough. Right? So now on this side of the cross, because sin requires death, I'm going to divert for a little bit, sin requires death. And so Jesus had no sin and that body died on that cross. And that disannulled the law of sin and death, right? Because one without sin died. But in order to inherit that, you have got to obey what Jesus tells you to do. Repent, be baptized in his name for the washing away of your sins and be filled with his spirit. The same spirit that breathed life in you on this side of the cross when you have the Holy Ghost. It's a constant renewing and refreshing of that breath of life in you. Amen? So Jesus said, a new spirit, amen. So we're going to have a new heart. We have to have a new heart and a new spirit. It says, how would God spiritually transplant within his people new hearts? Removing their stony hearts that were hardened and desensitized by sin. Would it really be possible for such a change of heart within 
unregenerated individuals. You have got to realize we in these last day and age have to guard our eyes, guard our hearts, guard our lives. There's this thing called desensitization, amen, I can't get that out, all right, where you get used to seeing the bad things and so it becomes the normal thing. So yesterday, me and my wife, we took a trip, a family trip. All of us got together, amen, and we took a trip. It was a little field trip that we took to the Barstow Dump, right? We talk about going down there and the smell. And on the way back, I was like, yeah, well, you know, because we were talking about, I couldn't imagine being down there in the summer when the heat kicks up and all that stuff starts to smelling. And I was like, yeah, well, you go down there. Initially, when you get in there, it smells, but after a while, you get used to it. You don't even notice it anymore. Right? And it's the truth. It's the truth. You ever walk into a place and you're like, ooh, what's that smell? And then 10 minutes later, you're like, oh, I forgot about it. You can do the same thing with sin in your life. And this is, this is a little side note here, but what y'all watch on TV Initially, you'll see something and hear something where you're like, ooh. But if you don't turn that off, you will desensitize yourself to that thing that pricked your heart initially. And you will find yourself looking and, and, and listening to things that are worse down the line because of desensitization. Amen? So today, you may see somebody shoot a guy on TV, and you're like, oh, my goodness, right? And then later on down the line, it, it's now the norm. Oh, it happens all the time. It's a part of life. But all that is coming in here, and it is molding, believe it or not, who you are. It is creating standards for what you seek to be or what you seek to be right or wrong. Many of us get our ideas of right or wrong from TV more than we do from the Word of God. Because like pastor said, if you don't read your Bible in church, you probably don't do it at the house. If you don't pray at church, you probably don't do it at the house. Amen? So 1% of your entire week is not enough to mold who you are. You've got to give more. Amen? You've got to do more. Guard your eyes. So not only is it po was it possible for humans to experience a change of heart, spiritually but also it would involve a regeneration god had a plan to bring new life and new heart to those to whom he would bring redemption and salvation from sin his spirit would lead and guide believers into all truth and empower them to turn from their sinful path towards a transformed life of spiritual joy and victory to jesus christ the question is, what was I, where was I, who was I last year? What am I, who am I, where am I right now? Your comparison is not based on you to pastor or you to me. Amen? But when you're looking for the work of God in your life, you've got to say, Lord, where did you take me from? Because I'm not taking you anywhere. I, mean, I might take you to lunch or something, but that's about it, right? you pain, right? But I'm not taking you anywhere. But it is God through life is taking you from righteousness to righteousness. Amen. I he's taking you from here to there. And so to look at how far you have come or how, or how far you are going, take a glance back and say, you know what? That's what I used to be, but that doesn't please me anymore. Thank God for where I am here today. Jesus, take me further. Amen? Take me further. So a new desire. Because of sin, humanity had a heart problem. For their evil hearts sought after that which was contrary to the nature of God. Consequently, individuals needed a change of heart to affect positive change in their basic desires. God had a plan to change the hearts of individuals, thereby causing them to have a new, wholesome, and godly desire instead of their formerly corrupt and ungodly passions. We look at our desires and get frustrated, right? But realize that 
Our desire is not the root cause of the problem. Think about it. Amen? Think about it. The, Bible, the, the lesson here is saying that from our heart, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of here starts up in here. Amen? And here, believe it or not, supersedes here. Ask somebody in love, right? Lost in the sauce. Yeah, I just love her, right? I just love him. They could do no wrong, right? When you in love, you short circuit, right? This supersedes this. And so you have got to say to God, I want you to work on this. Yeah, this is good. I, I'm all about education. I'm all about schools. This is good. But this drives this. And in a point of survival, this is going to keep you, hallelujah, this is going to give you the energy and the motivation for this to figure out that I cannot quit. I have got to keep driving on. But it's got to come from down here. So if you want God to work on something that's going to make you survive, Jesus, here's my heart. But we go, Jesus, here's the left chamber. I'll give you this part. I need these other three chambers just in case somebody makes me mad. Right? I need these other two chambers because that's just who I am. Well, Jesus don't care about who you are. He wants to transform you because who you are is not good enough. Who you are can't take you to heaven, but who he makes you is going to do beyond that. It's going to take you to heaven. It's going to take your wife to heaven. It's going to take your kids to heaven. It's going to take your friends to heaven. If you allow God to change you from who you are to who he wants you to be, then, oh, my Lord, then you will fulfill true purpose in your life. So God wants to give us a new song. It says this, God would do more than change the heart and desire of an individual. He would give that person a new song. A person's heart affects whether he speaks evil or good. Matthew chapter 12 verse 20 verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Amen. But it also affects Uh-oh. Uh -oh. It also affects his worship. His worship. You won't sit on a bump on a log if you want to, but there's something holding you there. And whatever is holding you there, it's down in here. And it ain't pastor. It ain't brother Price. It ain't sister Price. It ain't your husband. It ain't your wife. It ain't your kids. It's you. Come on now. Let's stop pushing off our heart problems on everyone else because it's your heart and God is pricking your hearts here today so you have got to get to a point where you're like Jesus I accept that I'm the problem but I accept Lord God that you are the solution so oh hallelujah Jesus we have got to get to that point in our Christian walk with God to be a true Christian and allow God to change us amen Come on now, stop, stop kicking your problems off on somebody else. Ain't nobody make you mad. You chose to be mad. When I get mad at Avery, that's my fault. When I'm upset, I can't see that. But when I get down, God's like, mm-hmm, whose fault is it? You're like, yeah, mine. Lord, forgive me. Right? Your worship is a reflection of what's going on in your heart. The infilling of the Holy Ghost is an outward reflection of what happened when you turn over your heart. What we see is the outward reflection, but it is not the core of what's going on. By the time it comes on out here, God's already been working out here and down in here, right? Right? But when you raise that hand, that means that you have said to yourself, you know what? I acknowledge and I feel you, Jesus, so now I am going to choose to respond to you. Amen? Knowing this, you shouldn't come to the house of God and sit there when it's worship time. Right? Or prayer time. But you have got to get... Now, now, now this is not to make nobody mad. Okay? This ain't, this ain't to make nobody mad. 
But this is so that we can wake up and realize that, hey, you are lying to yourself. And personally, I don't even care because I can't take you to heaven. Right? I could be a little bit disappointed that, you know, Sister Price is just kind of like hanging out when church is going on and she ain't worshiping. I'm not saying that's going on. But you know, I get in the faith. You know, but, but I could be disappointed that that's going on, Right? But that can, I could only allow that to pull me away from what God needs to do in my life. And when it comes down to the Bible says, you will be without excuse. So if you want, if you think you can turn to God and say, Jesus, I ignored you because my wife made me mad. You got a second thing coming because that is not good enough. Amen. It's not. Right? So the reality of it all is this. If altar call is made and you don't move, you choose to be stubborn. Not God. If God is calling you and saying, hey, lift your hands and praise me, and you choose not to, it belongs to nobody else. You have chose today cursings over blessings, but you have made that choice. God brings you here to change you. He brings you here to renew you. He brings you here to preserve you. And he brings you here to make sure that one day you're going to stand in front of him and hear the faithful words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That is the only reason why you're here. I love the drums, but that ain't why I'm here because that can't take me to heaven. If I don't come in and get a connection with God, I would have wasted my time in this place. And that would have been my choice based on what I desired at that point in time. You worship God, church. Come on. You, hallelujah, Jesus. I can't even see that clock. I got to move on. But you worship God. Don't let nothing shut down your worship. The reason why the devil wants to shut down your worship is because he can know the word of God and he remembers it better than some of us. And he knows that the Bible says that he inhabits, God inhabits the praises of his people. So if the devil can shut you up and get you not to praise God, he knows that he can get you to separate from God. But if, oh hallelujah Jesus, if you say that I know the word of God and God inhabits my praises and hey if I got some filth in my life then I've got to repent of it, Jesus Forgive me now, move on and worship God and know that as you praise him, God is going to come down and inhabit your praises. Man, don't let the devil shut you up in worship service. Don't let him squash your praises. And don't let pride say you can't run the aisles. It ain't my thing. Well, your thing didn't get you here. And your thing ain't getting you further in life. But it's God's thing, right? He inhabits the praises of his people. A new freedom. A person with a new regenerated heart as a new rejuvenated desire to worship God. In the U.S. legal system, sometimes individuals can have past criminal records sealed or expunged, hiding the existence of certain arrests or, con or convictions. However, the best possible practice of expunging past records is available only through justification. The word clears, when God clears a record of sinful past, Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines justif justification as the act or process or state of being justified by God. Not man, by God. Justification is a complex theological concept, but perhaps we can understand it best by the simple idea of some, that someone once offered. They say this, justific justification is just as if I never sinned. It is as if God has expunged the record of all of our sins. That's what justification says, right? We remember right? But the fact that you remember don't mean that you weren't forgiven, right? So don't hold on to that memory. Oh, you done made me mad last year, right? Justification says it's all underneath the blood. And Jesus justifies. He sanctifies Amen? And so when he justifies you, yeah, you sinned last month and you probably did the same thing last week, but God, when you come to ask him for forgiveness and repentance, when you forgive God, it is a clean slate. 
freedom from the past. The new life available through Jesus Christ, first of all, frees us from our sinful past. The old life has passed away and all things are become new. If you have not received the Holy Ghost, then you are holding on to a life that is forever going to condemn you. Amen? Not seeking the Holy Ghost, not seeking to have the Spirit of God within you, is as if you have gone to the prison house, knocked on the door, took the keys from the prison bar, or the, the, the sheriff or whomever, and say, you know what, I'm going to go into this prison, I'm going to lock the door, Take the key and don't you bother me. That's what we do when we re reject salvation. But God is offering you freedom from your past. And then he's offering you freedom to become a child of God. After freeing us from our past lives, sin, guilt, and shame, God makes us his sons and daughters and frees us to inherit and enjoy the full benefits of being his children. You got some benefits coming to you. Amen? Army tore me up, but I love the benefits that's coming to me right now. Right? But the benefit that God has in store for you, you can only get through inheritance. That means that if, if, if you ain't done what needs to be done to be a child of God, then you got nothing coming. But don't look at your inheritance based on this world. Right? Because if you want to do that, then you've got to realize what Jesus got when he was here. Persecuted, mocked, jeered, right? And you mad at him because you didn't get that, that, that money last week? He got stoned and you mad at him because you didn't get that house or that car that you wanted? You're like, God, what's up with my inheritance? And he's all like, hey, look, I was bruised for your transgression. You ain't being bruised right now. Quit your whining. Right? Our inheritance with God is eternal. If you should do a comparison to what Jesus got here on this earth, you don't want that. Amen? You don't want to be beaten, stoned, and crucified. Anybody up in here want to do that? Is that on your bucket list? Because if not, we need to talk. Right? That's not your inheritance. But we get distracted with what we get here on this earth and, and what goes good for us here on this earth and what goes bad for us here on this earth and think that that is our inheritance. It is not. It is not. I go to prepare a place for you. Here's the promise that where I am, there you may be also. That's your inheritance. That's your promise. Amen? So our redemption or redemption, or it, it gives us freedom to become the children of God. And being a child of God gives us the opportunity to inherit the things of God. It also gives us a new hope. Salvation gives us a new hope. Salvation through Jesus brings new hope into every believer's heart. Without, without salvation, we all, we all were without hope. But through his redemptive work within us, he has given us great hope. We who had no hope have been given new hope through Jesus Christ. The hope we have in Christ strengthens us for our present need, and it helps to secure us in anticipation of the future. What God does, salvation in God, is not a once-for-all deal, okay? You can say that I was saved, amen, that initial experience of getting your sins washed away, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. I was saved from that old man that I used to be. Amen? But you could also say that each and every day as I wake up, I repent and I ask God, and I, it's a daily ongoing salvation because you're going to sin. You're going to mess up. Amen? And that sin is going to send you to hell. Can I get an amen? It is. Right? So you get a constant salvation every time you go down on your knees and say, God, I have sinned and I'm asking you to forgive me, wash my heart and make me clean. Then now you have earned, hallelujah, Jesus, or you have received that salvation ongoing. But one day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
One day, there'll be no sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow. One day, there's going to be one throne in heaven and one that sits on the throne, the Lion and the Lamb, Jesus Christ Almighty. And in that day when he says to you, enter in, thou good and faithful servant, that day is when you are truly saved. Think about it. As long as you're walking on this earth, you're at risk. You are at risk. I don't feel safe when I'm walking through a war zone. I'm at risk. I'm on guard. I'm ready to fight. I'm at risk. And this world out there is a war zone if you desire to be a true Christian here today. If you want to just take the title and, you know, do what you want to do, then you're good. The devil ain't going to worry about you. But if you desire that I'm going to give my heart to God, I'm going to give my life to God, and I will be a Christian as according to the word of God, then you got to realize that the devil ain't going to like that, and he's going to bring some stuff your way. So you are not saved. So everything out there that says once saved, always saved, tell them to stop lying to you and stop lying to themselves and start repenting and asking God for forgiveness so that one day you can be free from all this mess. Because if you keep that attitude and you keep that mindset, you're going to be burning in the pit of hell saying, Lord, I wish I was saved. Lord, I wish I was free. But Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Right? And so to have that life more abundantly, you have got to recognize we can't lie to ourselves. It don't do no good. Just waste time. So we got to recognize that we are sinners, born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Got it. Now what can I do? You need repentance. Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, now I know what I got to do. God Make like Nike and just do it, right? Right? We know what to do. But we have the choice, C-H-O-I-C-E, to do whatever we want to do. Anybody ask you that crazy question about what kind of God would make such a bad thing happen? They don't know what they're talking about. It's the same kind of God that will let you stand there and ask that crazy question. You have freedom and choice to do what you desire to do. If you choose to shoot me today, God may not stop you. I pray that he does, but it's your choice to make, and it's your reward to gain if you want to do that, right? But realize this, because you do it, it don't mean that God wants you to do it, amen? But you have a choice, and I have a choice, amen? I could tell you not to shoot me. I could play Matrix, right? But I have a choice. In your salvation, in your walk with God, you have a choice. God gives us hope. That hope is for today. And that hope is for tomorrow. But I want to add to that 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 hope is for eternity. Because God operates outside the expanse of time. We all, we stuck in time. Hey, come 9 o'clock tomorrow, y'all best be at work if you got to be at work or you're going to be in trouble, right? We are stuck in time. But God operates outside the expanse of time. However, he has given us the night and the day. And he has said to us, choose you this day whom you are going to serve. And so now the responsibility is in your hands, what you're going to do with this night and day that God has given you. But know this, the Bible says in the Revelation that everyone is going to stand before the Lord to be judged. Don't judge me. Hey, I ain't judging you. That's the word of God, right? Get over it. We are all going to have to stand before the mighty God to be judged according to our works. When the Bible says according to our works, think about it as according to your choices, what you choose to do with the life that God has given you. And realize this, that if you reject God and you say, God, well, you know, I didn't serve you because the money wasn't coming in, that ain't going to be good enough because ain't no money coming in in Cambodia, but they're worshiping God anyway. Right? If we could all stand internalizing the message it says when individuals repent of their sins are baptized in jesus name for the remission of sins and receive the holy spirit they receive a brand new life and relationship with jesus christ amen is a life please sister price is a life 
of many new things and experiences. But most of all, it is a secure life of hope and certainty as children of God. As a child of God, you don't care if somebody can shoot you. You don't care if someone can kill you. Paul was a child of God. And Paul says, do what you want to do. To be absent from the flesh is to be present with God. I got my priorities straight. So you could kill me if you want to. That's cool. I'm going to thank you as I'm ascending. Because this world is not my home. This may be all you have, but this ain't all I have. I'm just passing through. I got much more to look forward to than a nine to five job and bills and problems that just won't go away. I got more to look forward to. So if you snatch me out of this world, hey, high five as I'm leaving. But God is where I want to be. God is my hope and God is my refuge and God is my goal. My desire is to make heaven my home. That's priority. It is confronting hallelujah Jesus it is a life of many new things and experiences but most of all it is a secure life of hope and certainty amen secure life of hope and certainty it is a comforting and encouraging feeling to experience absolute certainty in our relationship with Jesus Christ some people are insecure by nature even regarding their spiritual experiences however even insecure individuals can experience the certainty of redemption we do not have to experience uncertainty about our salvation can i get an amen and our new life with jesus we can know for certain we are saved in him and we can have great hope for this life and for all of eternity if you're in this house here today and you woke up this morning with any question in your mind as to whether or not you're going to make heaven your own, I want to challenge you. I'm going to give you a choice here today to come up here and lock me out, lock the rest of the church out, and get in tune with your God. I want to open up this altar here today, hallelujah, Jesus, to give you an opportunity to come forward and say, God, here is my life. I give it over to you if you have not done that yet. And if you just think you're strong, the Bible says when you think you're strong, be careful because that's when you're going to fall. So if you're thinking you can strong and, and you can do it right now, well, I'm opening up this altar for you today to say to God, Jesus, in my weakness, you are made strong. In my physical strength, I'm in danger. So I don't want to rely on that. As Sister Price sings, I'm going to turn our service over to Pastor Scott. But I'm going to open up the altar here just for a few moments. So you can just come and you ain't talking to me and you ain't talking to Pastor, but you're talking to your God. He brought you here. He desires to change you. He desires to restore you. He desires to communicate with you. But the choice is yours here today to communicate with him. The altar is open for me a few moments. Pastor Scott, in Jesus' name.